Welcome back in. It's the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. Sean Fitz has gone fishing. We mentioned that last week. Away for a few days. He'll be back to help us break down what we see at practice on Wednesday here at Penn State. We've got another spring practice opening, some practice availability. We're going to hear from Manny Diaz, the defensive coordinator, for the first time since he got to work with this Nittany Lions defensive unit. A couple of players as well, kicker Jake Pinnegar, linebacker Curtis Jacobs, and of course James Franklin. So content at lions247.com. Uh, and then we'll be back with you later in the week with the second episode to run through things we got a lot of recruiting to discuss here because with sean out we're bringing in brian doan our good friend and national recruiting analyst with 24 7 sports you've heard him a lot here on the podcast for our loyal listeners we got plenty of catching up to do we've got to talk about a class edition that occurred this sunday and then a, a class subtraction just one sunday before that let's start with the good news brian uh and, and first off welcome back to the show here on lines 24 7 podcast yeah, I thought that was the good news that I'm back. And I'm guessing Fitz not only went fishing, but there's probably some QPR game that he's got to watch that, you know, maybe they have to keep from going to League One or something. I don't know. They don't win very much. So, you know, Fitz is probably getting over that, too. Glad you got your jab in early. Uh, with that said, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Rappelier, uh we had talked about this tight end for a while about, although he's been committed to Michigan for some months, Penn state very much in the thick about it. You've reported this. And then on Sunday coming to fruition, a commitment flip from the Michigan Wolverines to the Penn state Nittany Lions. He is number eight in this class. Neo Avery, of course, left the class a Sunday before we'll talk about Avery, but Rappelier continues that, you know, collection of tight end recruits that Penn state has done a really nice job with in recent cycles. Yeah, I think, you know, well, not I think I know when I was speaking with him, not only during the process, when he committed to Michigan, when he said he was going to make some visits um, and, and kind of try to figure where things stood. And, and I know some some coaching staff changes at Michigan really opened his eyes to, hey, where am I the most comfortable, not only in an offense, but as a person? I always thought it was Penn State and, you know, there was a time in early January where I thought he was going to commit to the Nittany Lions. And, you know, there was talk. You mentioned Neo Avery, who at the time was in the class. Matthias Barnwell was in the class. Um, the tight end out of out of um, Pennsylvania, Joey Schlafler. I'm sure I'm butchering his name, so apologies, Joey. But, uh, you know, there were questions, are they going to have enough room for Rappelier? And I've always viewed Neo Avery as an edge guy. I don't really – care what Penn State was saying as far as tight end. Matthias Barnwell is a bit different because of his body type. He he would be a jumbo tight end, and I think at the end of the day, he'll move to the offensive line just because, you know, he's agile, he's long, he can add weight to his frame easily and, and probably be an NFL offensive lineman. And so I always thought there was room in there for Rappelier, but I don't know if Penn State always felt that way. He really liked Michigan as well. He, he had been waiting for that offer pretty much throughout December when I was talking to him. So it was going to be one of the two schools. But even after he committed, I always felt like he was more comfortable at Penn State and would look for a reason maybe to get back into the Penn State class. Or And some of those things started happening. And the Neo Avery decommitment had nothing to do with Rappelier committing back to Penn State. Um, that was going to happen regardless. So, so don't read too much into that. But for me, you know, he was a kid that the first day he could visit in September, where did he go? Penn State. Um, and, and so those are things that you really look at and pay attention to when you have all these options to go check out places. And he just always fit. Penn State can develop tight ends. You know, he and I were rattling some off on Sunday. Uh, you know, I even forgot about Jesse James when you go down the list of guys. Um and so everything just fit, and I think it was just more of a timing of when he would decide to make that official. Yeah, Pat Fryermuth, obviously a big first season in the NFL. Mike Kosicki got franchise tagged during his honeymoon. He's had a good offseason. Uh, so the tight end brand, we've got a lot to learn about some of the guys on campus, former blue chip prospects like Brenton Strange, uh, Theo Johnson. You got Tyler Warren converted from quarterback when he got here. And then some of the younger guys, Khalil Dinkins, Jerry Cross. we got a lot to learn about them. But – Having two recent and guys who are fairly young in the NFL and scoring a bunch of touchdowns, what has that done for Penn State's appeal, even as they lost Tyler Bowen last offseason? Yeah, it's it's huge just from the standpoint of this is where guys like Rappelier want to get to, right? And so they see him playing on Sundays. And I, I don't care how 
involved you are in recruiting as a kid and, and how many offers you have. When some dude from the NFL is hitting you up, telling you about how good Penn State is, there's nothing bad that really comes of that, right? And so all that stuff all factors into it. But yeah, you, you listen, for better or for worse, every kid going to a Power 5 school thinks they're going to play in the NFL, right? That's what makes them great. That's what gives them the drive. But there's also, you know, some realism that is needed. So he his view is, hey, I want to go play in the NFL. And Penn State's got a couple guys that really are, you know, showing out right now. And then Friar Muth is a New England guy, so that helps. I mean, there's just a lot of um, things that will work in Penn State's favor when recruiting tight ends. You mentioned playing up in Massachusetts right now and um, got a chance to, to watch some of his film from last year, shared it on our message board as well. Curious what you have seen. I'm not sure if you've gotten a chance to get a long look at him in some oh, yeah. kind of camp setting to this point, but based on what he has put on the field, what kind of a tight end prospect are we talking about? Yeah, it's interesting because he was more of a pass catcher when he was playing. You know, he's from New York, right? He goes and boards at Milton Academy in Massachusetts where his brother went and then his brother went to play offensive line, I think, at Wake Forest. So he understands who he, who he is. And when he was at Our Lady of Lords in New York, uh, I think it was Poughkeepsie, he was basically a pass catcher. And he was there, you know, running routes. And so he showed some good ball skills, some ability to get off at the snap, get into his route. Now, you're playing upstate New York, the competition, you know, you're not really facing any other high-level kids. He wanted to learn how to block better, be more of an inline guy, which is why he went to Milton Academy. They run the ball a ton. They don't throw it a lot. So he really got to work on that aspect of it. Um, he's an athletic kid. You watch him, you can throw down the basketball pretty easily, dunking. Um, he stays low when he blocks. I spoke to a couple of the, you know, I made a swing through New England in November and even when you're hitting up to schools, they've all are playing each other. So you you talk to coaches about different kids. And and he was a kid that they they worried about not as a kid who was going to stretch the field and run down the seam, but as a kid who knew how to sit in holes, who could use his size against the linebacker, release from the line of scrimmage well, a willing blocker who would be physical. And he is um you know, he, he's more of a, a gritty, tough kind of tight end who will make some catches, but he'll be an all around kind of tight end where you're not going to. I mean, look, you got to have to teach him to block, but you're not going to have to make him believe that he has to block. I mean, I remember we go back to Gesicki and I remember talking to Mike when he was a junior and he was like, man, I can't believe you have me rated as a tight end. I should be a receiver. <laughs> well, Mike, it, I mean, I, I know what you're saying because you you kill it at Southern Regional as yeah. a receiver, but. Trust me, you're, you're probably going to be a tight end moving forward. And so it took a while for, for Mike to sit there and go, yeah, I did, do need to learn how to block and, and really embrace that. And, and Rappier is already there. I don't, you know, is he the athletic freak that maybe a, a Brenton Strange is or, or a Gasicki is? I, I haven't seen that yet, but it doesn't mean he's a bad athlete. He's still an above average athlete. Um, and I think he could do a lot of different things. He, you know, to me, Tyler, he's more of like um, Jesse James would be, you know, kind of a guy like that for me. We've got him listed at six foot five, 225 pounds. He's the number 15 tight end uh, in the composite, number 25 tight end in 24 7 sports rankings right now. And, and it's a two tight end class. We've seen that for Penn State in 2018. Uh, Zach Coons, Pat Fryermuth, 2020 uh, with Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren. Uh, it looks like we're going to see it again in 2023. Shifting gears a little bit um, because Penn State's done a nice job stockpiling some talent on the offensive side of the football thus far in the 2023 cycle. Number five class in 24-7 sports composite rank rankings right now. But you look at the defensive side, uh, you know, Neo Avery was was an important factor there early on. And, you know, once yeah. it was settled, going to focus on the edge position. He opened it up when you were on your way to, to go talk to him and, and go see guys down at the camp in Maryland. <laughs> I, was, I was actually <laughs> sitting on the track. I was standing on the track watching kids check in, knowing, texting with them. He's like, hey, I'll be there about 20 minutes. <laughs> You may, yeah, you may have watched him fire off the tweet uh, about his decommitment, <laughs> but um, I guess let's start in, in that moment leading up to the decommitment. We talked a little bit about it with Sean last week, but you had a chance to talk with him, and, and it just seems like this was the transparent way to handle the process. I think that's a great way to put it. He's going to be at Ole Miss this weekend. There's some other places he, he definitely wants to go check out, and 
Listen, he has not made a ton of visits. Last, you know, he, he was an AAU basketball kid, so he didn't make a ton of visits because he was playing basketball at one point. Goes down to Georgia last summer, kills it at a camp. Looks like he's going to wind up committing to Georgia as a tight end. And, you know, they would love his athleticism. And really, um, he showed out at that camp. So then it stays kind of quiet. He decides not to commit, but it's, you know, because Penn State among the schools called him and said, whoa, you know, make sure you give us a, a legit look. And he had been to campus a few times with Penn State. And so he really focused on Penn State. McDonough plays some Saturday game. I mean, uh, Good Counsel plays some Saturday games. So it, it's it's tough for him to get some places, um, especially Friday night. You're playing a physical game. Do you really want to get in the car and drive seven hours or whatever? But at the end of the day, for me, he hadn't gone out to see a lot of places and he needed to do that. And you could do it one of two ways. You can do it as a committed prospect. And then you raise the eyebrow of a bunch of other commits that are like, well, wait a minute, he's going, why can't I? Or you decommit. I still think, you know, Penn State is really still heavily involved with him. Um, talking to some people, they said they wouldn't be shocked if he would wind up back with Penn State. Me personally, it's always dicey to get a kid to recommit. But I think this is the kind of style kid that would re that could recommit in the future. There's a couple of things going on with Neo as well, Brian, the, the injury recovery, the fact that he's been discussed as a both sides of the ball kind of power five prospect. Where do you land on him? Obviously, you have a, a high input into our ranking system. He's a top 24 seven edge rusher. Uh, what do you think about the next three or four years when we talk about Neo Avery's trajectory? Because I think people focus in on who he is right now and they have a little trouble sorting through it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Tyler. And a couple of things. Um, he says he's going to be ready for the start of his season, which is good. You know, he had a knee injury. Uh, I think people saw him tweet out about it. I don't really like to get into the particulars of an injury. I'll let the kid handle that. Um, but he should be. He told me he should be ready for the season, which is good. Now, <clears throat> I've seen him practice. I've seen him practice as a quarterback, and I watched him play against St. John's in a WCAC title game as an edge. Um, He's an edge. You're, you're, he's got length. He's got burst. He has the size that he can easily get up to 255 and play that position. He's incredibly athletic and can get off. You know, can can get off at the snap and get to the quarterback. He can drop into coverage. There's a lot of different things he can do um, as a defender. And then you look at it. Well, which is the premium position? Well, it's edge, right? Guys can go get to the quarterback. Them in corners are the premium positions on a defense. He has the ability to do all that. So I don't know why anybody would want to put him on the offensive side when he has all those skills that you can put on defense and, and really change a game with what he can do as long as he continues to develop. And, and I think, Tyler, when you talk about, you know, where he can be, I think people really there's – a, there's a set of people that understand what we do with rankings, and then there's a set of people – that don't fully get it. And they say, well, he's a not a great player now, or he is a great player now. Listen, man, our rankings are where you're going to be in about four years. When it comes time for your name, if you're going to be either done with school or going to the NFL, what are you going to be? Um, that That's where we're trying to figure out what you are, and that's what we're ranking you on. And, and Neil Avery, like I said, his burst, his length, his athleticism, his frame, all that puts him at a, as a high-level player. Neil Avery no longer in the class, but Brian, a couple of top 24-7 prospects are, and, and we'll start with Alex Birchmeyer, uh, number number 23 overall. He's still the top offensive uh, lineman on the interior, and you came up with the uh, the comparison last year, I believe. You talked about this on the podcast after he initially committed. Quinton Nelson, who just a superior player at Notre Dame, gone on to be an all-pro with the Indianapolis Colts. Um, where has he come? I, I don't think we've talked about Alex since uh, his junior season on the show with you no and and that's because he's been on board for so long it's like okay who's next but yeah, yeah i mean yeah. he's still he's he's coming off of just a fantastic junior season physical athletic can pull bends really well continues to be a high level wrestler in the state of virginia which is something you see more and more with offensive linemen because it talks about you know when you're looking at wrestling and how does that translate to football flexibility which is ability to bend um, body control, 
balance, it all factors in. So seeing him do that, you know, he's got a brother, I believe, that wrestles at Navy. So it's in the genes. And he's just a real solid kid. You know, he's going to put in the work when nobody's looking and he's not going to tell you he's put, you know, I'm not seeing Alex Birchmeyer tweet out every 40 minutes about what he's working on next. He just gets the job done, continues to move forward. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe in freshmen playing on the offensive line very much in college. It, you know, you're talking about kids that need to get stronger technique wise and, and also learn how to be a college student. He's probably about as close as you're going to get to somebody that can come in and play really that early in his career. And again, I, I go back, Quentin Nelson played at Red Bank Catholic about 35 minutes from where I live. Um, I remember watching him play and I remember him making a block like 50 yards downfield, just absolutely hauling just so he could hit a kid in the run game to help out his running back who broke a long run. I could see Birchmeyer with some similar athleticism. Um, I don't think anybody knew how good Quentin Nelson was going to be once he got to Notre Dame and now that he's with the Colts. But, you know, one of the, one of the key aspects to being a high-level player is what's your support system like also? Quentin had a great one, and Alex has a great one as well. Someone on this current Penn State roster that will yell from the rooftops about the impact of, of wrestling success translating to football. P.J. Mustafer won himself a couple yeah. of state titles down in Maryland, now a team captain and a huge piece of this Penn State roster. He'll tell you just about any, every interview about the influence of his wrestling career on his success. Um, we have yeah, and, and Tyler, uh, Tyler, along those yeah. lines, I mean, you're talking yeah. about, you know, I mentioned all the other stuff, but what's the line of scrimmage? It's winning your one-on-one -on -one battles and, and wrestling's winning the one-on-one -on -one battle. Yeah. Uh, Javen Williams, also on the offensive line, also in the top 100 of 24-7 sports rankings. You may have noticed on our message boards at Lions 24-7, there's a bit of a clamoring for improved offensive line play, improved offensive line depth. The really? two guys in the top no. 100. <laughs> no, this is really? two guys in the top 100. Uh, we, hmm. we got to know Alex a lot earlier in the process. Williams, of course, the in-state guy, number one in Pennsylvania rankings on our site. Why is he uh, such a slam dunk prospect in your opinion? Um, listen, man, I don't think anybody's a slam dunk. I mean, that's, that's, that's a hard label for me to apply. Let me, let me put it this way. Why is he a top 100 prospect by 24 yeah, seven sports measure? I was going to say, that's <laughs> bad. I mean, listen, man, they, they can't even get slam dunks in the NFL and they spend no. billions of dollars trying to figure this stuff out. Um, to me, it's again, it's the, it's the pure athleticism and it's the length, the size, the ability for for growth within his frame but then you're also you know not only you watch film you see his explosion but you see what he's done on the track as a as a thrower discus shot put and he has just some unbelievable numbers there as a sophomore where he you know you figure he's going to grow even more in the next year and the throwing stuff again it, it's it's balance it's work ethic it's the ability to explode through the lower body. Um, and so that's how the, the track throwing translates when you're trying to figure out as a football player. And listen, I, I don't know if Penn State fans will be happy with this or not, but give Pitt a lot of credit because I believe Pitt was the first one to really be active after him and and really move on him and, and, and try to get him. And and they recognized these traits really early in the process. I think, I think before a lot of others did. Um, and then once people started really delving into him a little bit more, they saw, geez, not only is this kid pretty good right now, and you, you see the way he pulls on some of the tape when you watch it, but his his ceiling growth is great. And, and as Penn State fans know, you know, you got to get some guys with length. I know the Penn, I, I know at Lions 247, they love the fact that you could recruit a lot of guards. I mean, I, I see ton that in every yes. ton of guards. But, yeah. you know, you're looking at a guy like Williams, I think he could be a swing guy. And listen, Birchmeyer is an interior guy, but if you need him to play right tackle, I'm sure he can handle it just fine. Brian, just beyond the top 24-7, you know, you kind of sort through who might be next up. I'd love to hear your opinion. There's a few guys who are composite four stars. Rappelier <laughs> is one of them. Barnwell. Pain at cornerback. Um, it's an eight-man group. There's not a ton of players to sort through here, but right now in the process, who do you think has a good chance of maybe being that riser who's not in the top 24-7 yet, but through the next few months could find themselves making that move? You know, it, it 
all of them. I mean, it, it, every prospect always gets looked at. I mean, every every time we go through stuff and we have new data, they get looked at. So you're looking at Lamont Payne. Is he going to run track and is he going to put – you know, I'm going to see Lamont Payne probably this weekend at a 7-on-7. Seven seven. So we'll see him there. Is he going to run track and put up some track numbers that really catch your eye? Same with Rapelier. Is he going to do anything on the track that can really make you catch, you know, catch his eye or, or are you going to see him live somewhere? Um, you know, Anthony Dunker, the offensive lineman down in Virginia, who I, I think Penn State has a chance to get a real steal on that one. We'll see how he develops. Um, all the Virginia Light Ridge, which is a new school. Not a lot of people knew about them. Um, so you're always looking for that new information. And so if I say, hey, here's a guy, I don't have anybody right now committed to Penn State that I sit there and I say, okay, if this happens, he's a four star. I mean, if Lamont Payne is running track and all of a sudden goes out and runs a 10 8, he's going to be a four star probably. Um, you know, if Rapelier decides he's going to go to some camp somewhere or combine or whatever, and run a four six, then then yeah. But right now, that stuff's not going to happen. It, it just it, there's a lot more to it than just oh well, this kid looks good. I, I know people think that well, geez, he committed to Bama or Ohio State or this school, so we're going to raise him, or he committed to school X, so we're going to drop him. That's not really how this works. I mean, you're always trying to look for information on on how um, it can help you moving forward to adjust somebody's rating, right? whether higher or lower. Um, does Rappelier grow two inches? You know, all, all stuff like that. Yeah, I think what this time last year, uh, Drew Aller may or may not have already been in a four-star territory, may have still been a three-star, and of course ends up in the top five overall with the rankings. A lot to sort through. That was a unique case, of course, but I want to do a little bit of rapid fire, and you can make it as rapid as you like. But there's a lot of targets. Yeah, you, out there. I, I'm known. For, I'm known for being really quick with my answers, so that's, this is going to go well. Uh, open to interpretation, rapid. Um, but let's go with Emilio Agard because he tweeted yesterday, uh, confirming something I believe he told you uh, a couple of weeks ago. Going to be at Penn State this right. weekend. It's his first trip since uh, last year's whiteout game. Uh, offer as a freshman, Terry Smith leading the charge. And uh, it seems like relatively quiet when we're talking about a five star cornerback recruit out of Philadelphia. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of things with Emilio was, hey, he's, he's a class at 24 kids, so it's a little bit slower with him right now. There's there's not kind of that push to really go. Um, St. Joe's prep kids are usually a little more laid back with their recruitment. Um, people want to see his size, what, what his legit size is. Is he 5'10"? Is he 6 feet tall? Um, and again, can you get out there and get some testing numbers on him, uh, waiting to see – what he ran down in Baltimore at Under Armour. So you're looking at all things like that with him. And again, he's a 24, so he's going to relax and take his time with recruiting. Yeah. And I should know that's a, a composite five star on, on, and I think 24 seven sports given out maybe a dozen uh, five stars. Oh, maybe it, actually it's, high. Not, it's not, I yeah. don't even think it's that close. We, we listen, all you need to know is that at the end of the cycle, the top 32 guys on two, four, seven sports will be five stars. So figure yeah. it out from there, but yes. Um, another name who's going to be getting to campus later in April, Rodney Gallagher. Uh, he's on the move quite a bit this month. Uh, very high on Penn State's board, has been for a long time. Wide receiver, some clarity uh, over the past few months in terms of basketball versus football. Um, is Penn State position wise, uh, where are they right now in this recruitment process with Rodney Gallagher? Uh yeah, I mean, they're in a good spot. I think he's going to check out Notre Dame. I think Michigan is also on his list. West Virginia is really high on Gallagher. And Penn State, I mean, you know, don't forget his mom went to Penn State. Um, he holds that very, very close to him, and he's been up a bunch of times. He, he doesn't really need to see anything else at Penn State. It's about seeing other places. Where are they? They're, they're in it. I mean, I keep hearing West Virginia is a sleeper to watch. Um so keep an eye on West Virginia and, and we'll see. But I think with Gal well, not I think I know with Gallagher, where he visits this spring will give a large indication of what he's thinking with official visits. And then Penn State just has to keep working and working with him. He's been on the radar as an elite athlete in Pennsylvania for a long time, going back to earliest years, yeah. the earliest year of uh, high school. And Tamir Robinson, also yeah. someone we've talked about a lot when in terms of Penn State and their 2023 board. Right. Um, he's moved his way up to an edge prospect. And he's a guy who I think right. may have been listed as a safety when he first appeared online on 24-7 sports. Um, 
what what do you think about ultimately his position? Because this is this a guy there's a consensus on at the college level, or is he hearing a couple different narratives from coaching staffs on how he fits within their scheme? Well, when he broke onto the scene as a safety, he was six foot one. He's now mm-hmm. six four. And so you don't see too many six four safeties running around back there in the NFL. Um I think for him, most schools are now settled on the fact he's going to be an edge. Again, he's coming off of an injury that he suffered his junior year. So he he's he should be healthy again by his senior season. But, you know, take your time with it and, and make sure he's healthy. He was just at Miami. Again, I'm here in West Virginia is doing well with him. Penn State, of course, will do well. He's from Pittsburgh, Brashear. So, you know, Terry Smith with his connections out there for Penn State. But, yeah, I mean, so I was at a camp in Pittsburgh in July. And he was there playing outside linebacker, moving around. And this is what I love about Tamir, and I love prospects like this. So we're there, and somebody says to him, hey, Tamir, because we see how big he is now, right? He, he, he's, he's legit size. I, I'm, I'm 6'3", and he's taller than me, whatever that's worth. So we know his size is legit. And trust me, my size is not being falsified. Um, <laughs> but so they, they so hey, Tamir, go line up at DN and, and do a couple one-on-ones. He comes over and he does a few one-on-ones. He wins a few. He loses a few. I'm talking to him after, he's like, yo, that's the first time I've ever lined up as a DN. Now that, that was kind of fun. And so I love it. Dude. It wasn't like, well, if I do this, it's going to hurt my ranking or I can't do this or I'm not prepared. He's like, they want me to try. Yeah, sure. Why not? And and But you saw him in that element and he just looks like an edge. I mean, can he be like an outside linebacker in a 3-4 yeah, but I mean, similar to what an edge is going to do. You know, to me, he, he at his size, his burst, his ability to get to the quarterback, he can, you know, he can dip his shoulder and get around the edge. We go back to the Neo Avery thing, very similar kind of kids. Neo probably a little bit taller, a little bit longer, but very similar. And the closer you can get them to the line of scrimmage to go get that quarterback, the more valuable they become. Want to go to the other side of the state here. A couple Philadelphia prospects seems like they're starting to narrow focus as they get toward the finish line a bit here. You've written on that in the last week or so. One, the son of former Eagles star linebacker Jeremiah Trotter, Josiah Trotter. The other, Jameel Lyons, uh, both and out of the city of Philadelphia, both have a Penn State offer, and and, and the Nittany Lions in that cluster of recruiting uh, contenders at this stage. Yeah, I, I think with. Josiah, I think it's, you know, South Carolina, Clemson, Penn State, West Virginia, Virginia Tech are the ones that, you know, it's his top five. He's going to announce, I believe, oh, geez, everybody can see how old I am that's watching this. So forgive me, but I think it's the 14th he's announcing or the 15th, whatever, whatever day. That's what he, April he's 15th is what you, yeah, April, April 15th, 15th, what you reported. Yep. See that? We should make Lance edit this, and I'll just go, he's announcing April 15th, and then he's got to go do all the work. Get on it, Lance, yeah. (laughs) But uh, so, you know, the visits he's made recently, West Virginia Virginia, and Virginia Tech, that's kind of where I look right now. Um, You know, he doesn't have anything planned between now and then. I'm supposed to see him at a 7-on-7 this weekend, so I'll catch up with him again. Um, 7-on-7's in Pottstown not too far from campus. So if he makes it up to Penn State, then I think you pay a little bit more attention to it. And I think the other one was Jemiel Lyons, right, you mentioned? Yeah, yep. Um, Right now he's going to announce, I think August 4th, he's talking about doing it on his mom's birthday, um, kind of a present to her. And listen, it's a different kind of grouping of schools with him. Pittsburgh, Penn State, uh, I think West Virginia, Cincinnati, Illinois, if, if memory serves right. Um, he's supposed to be at Penn State on Wednesday and then Pittsburgh and then Cincinnati. So I think, you know, I, I saw him at a seven on seven over the weekend. He moves really well. His length is legit. I saw him play early in his junior season. And you can see some of the characteristics you really wanted, but he was just kind of getting into the flow after really not having a sophomore season. His tape is really impressive with the way he moves. And then it's confirmed when, when I watch him move in person over the weekend. And listen, I think if you're Penn State, again, he, he's an edge type, good size, 6'4", 240, 245, um, has length, has some versatility with being able to drop into coverage. 
you know, it's all kind of the Tamir Robinson, Neo Avery, Jamiel Lyons kind of body structure, all very similar. And, and that's what you want. You're looking for, for body types and who can play that position and develop. So to me, Penn State wants them. They need to get them, right? With that grouping of schools, you got to go get them. Really quickly, staying in the state and then looking elsewhere, um, a couple of running backs that have emerged um, in this 2023 class, Marquise Wilson, or Will, Marquise Williams, I should say, and then London Montgomery. Um, Williams is a top 10 running back in 24-7 sports rankings. London Montgomery just outside the top 25. Um, each of them in the state here, um, obviously Penn State uh, coming off of a really, really strong running back class, Katron Allen, Nick Singleton. There's some intrigue about how they'll follow it up if the right fit's going to come in the state or from beyond, what is your assessment of Williams and Montgomery uh, right now in, in the state of Pennsylvania? Do, do you, you know, come down higher on, on Marquise Williams? Is that accurate based on the reflection of these rankings? Um, I, I'm not going to say that. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think Marquise Williams, I think you're looking at for the most part, I know he was just on campus, but I kind of get the sense it's more Minnesota, Virginia tech, Maryland right now with him. And there's the London Montgomery thing, who's at a Scranton prep. That's an interesting one because he, when London visited in January, he told me, listen, Penn State's going to keep watching me. I'm going to run some tracks, see if I can get that number down into the 10 nines, into the 10 eights. He's, I think he was about 11, 11, one as a sophomore, which is still, I mean, you know, not Tyler Donahue speed, but still pretty no. quick. But um, so I thought he would get back to campus and he still could this spring. But he's visited a lot of other places. He was just at Rutgers. He's got a visit coming up to West Virginia. He's got another one coming up to Maryland. And if you're at Scranton Prep and you have that Penn State offer and Penn State is going to push for you, you would think at some point this spring he would get to campus. And, and that could still happen. So for me, if London Montgomery gets back to campus – I keep an eye out for him, you know, going to Penn State. But if he doesn't set that visit at some point to get to campus, either before or for the spring game, then you have to look and see, okay, are they targeting another running back maybe in the class? Casting the spotlight beyond Pennsylvania, Brian, I feel like it's impossible not to place it immediately on Nicholas Harbor. You wrote about, uh, I think on Monday, what he's doing on the track circuit. And we've talked about this on the show before, the kind of otherworldly talent that you're seeing displayed uh, on the track. It, when you talk about football potential, people drooling over all that. What do you make of this young man? You've covered a lot of recruits. And in terms of just raw athleticism, he's got to be pretty darn high on that list. You know, yeah, it's it's interesting. First of all, when I met with him at his school, he is a big human being. I mean, when I say 6'5", I mean, it's legit. And so, listen, I don't like comparisons. I don't really do comparisons. So take this for what it's worth. It's from a body type standpoint. It's not from a, this is who he's going to be. I've never met Usain Bolt. But when I watch him run track, he looks a lot bigger than everybody else. And I don't know much about track other than I know I would not be very good at it. But that's what Nicholas Harbour is. You watch the video and he just towers over guys. He's just he's really big. He's impressive. He runs, obviously, at an elite level. So I wonder what direction he goes with that. I spoke with his coach down at Archbishop Carroll in D.C., Robert Harris, on Monday about him. And I said, what do you think? And, and the feeling right now is he's probably going to go play football in college and also run track. So I said, well, if he's going to go play edge, he's going to get up to 255. Is he still going to run track? And he goes, well, he could still do that because he's still that elite. Now the times won't be what they are now. I mean, the dude ran a 10, three, two, for goodness sake in a hundred. And so maybe it goes to a 10, six, I don't know, but that's going to have to be a determination made. But I, I go back to the kid that I think about is Grant Holloway kid out of Virginia Beach a few years back who I think ran the Olympics right in the 200 or whatever it was again I'm not a big track guy but I remember Grant he was talking about football and track up until the last minute and then he called me he's like hey I'm, I'm going to commit to Florida I'm like oh good where do you see yourself fitting in and he's like I'm going to run the 100 <laughs> oh yeah. wait I, I, thought, I thought we were talking receiver or corner um 
So there's still a lot of time for Nicholas to make these decisions. He doesn't turn 17 until July. So it's not like he's a reclassed kid who's on the older end, but he, he it's, and I know I'm rambling a little bit, but he's such an intriguing prospect of, you know, if you look at him as an NFL potential kid with that athleticism, you could make a lot of money in that second contract, maybe even the first, if you get drafted high. Now the injury factor is a lot higher, but on the track side, it's going to take a while to earn, you know, a, a pretty good living, you know, that, that he could make in football if you could even do it on the track side. And again, it's further down after, after you get a little older. So it's a really interesting dynamic and, and I'm really curious to see what he decides. I think he'll wind up doing both, going to a school and doing both, but I'm really curious to see it. Usain Bolt, by the way, I looked it up uh, while you were speaking there, six foot five, which uh, apparently unofficially four inches taller than any of his primary competitors uh, at the last Olympics he competed in. So yeah, right. extraordinary. Um, okay. Let, let's move on because you can, go, you can talk about Harbor forever. Uh, Cam Selden yeah. is someone that you wrote a bit about, uh, put, put that up on lines 247com yesterday as well. A little bit of clarity, maybe not so much, but a guy who's starting to navigate his way and, and a really impressive athlete in his own right. When you say navigate his way, I, I, I think he is, right? So, but his soft top five, we'll call it. I mean, he, I think he told me it's an unofficial top five after his coach put out a top five, was places he's visited. And so what happens during the spring eval period? Now, listen, I went to his school um, in Heathsville, Virginia, which I've never heard of. I mean, people in Virginia have never heard of it, right? And it's an hour and a half from 95 on the northern neck. And so it's not an easy place for schools to recruit. And it's not a place where, you know, you could do your one-stop shop and we go somewhere and go hit up 15 kids. Or you can go recruit Cam Selden that day. Take your pick. Now, for me, when the eval period starts later this month and schools really can get out and see him and watch him move and watch him work out and watch him run, I think his recruitment can change a lot there. Um, again, I, I like, you know, he visited Tennessee. He loved it. He visited Penn State. You know, he, he, he loves Penn State. He went to Virginia with the old staff and he loved the fact that it was so close. But he's got to get out and see more places because he's that kind of athlete that I think those opportunities are going to come. And I think what will really be interesting with him is what happens in late May, June with visits. Does he start making officials? I mean, he went to Tennessee and I think there were, I wrote about it and, and I can't remember everybody was there. There were like eight people in his party that went to Tennessee. And so it's not just like Cam's going with, with mom to go check out a school. It, it is a family feel and, and the environment at his school is a real community environment. Um, it's an interesting one. I, I do not think it's even close to being settled. I, I could see much more movement in this one. Selden, the number 24 overall prospect in 24 seven sports rankings for 2023 class, number three athlete, Brian, another guy I wanted to get to, uh, in, um, to the South of Penn state, but obviously they wanted to be in that Penn state footprint, Tony Rojas, uh, a yeah. linebacker who, uh, you know, you spoke with him down in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago. I know Sean did as well. Sounds like things still training in a positive direction for, for Penn state. They had the change at linebackers coach and defensive coordinator, uh, this off season. What do you make of Rojas's recruitment as we get into the, the meat of the spring? It's an interesting one, and it's one that's not as easy to track as some of the others because, A, he's really not – I mean, listen, he's a nice kid. Talk to him, text with him, all that stuff. But he's kind of like, I don't know where I'm visiting, and then a day later, well, I think I'm going to visit here and here. He's going to go visit Tennessee, South Carolina, Clemson, also Miami. He already knows Penn State. He'll probably get back up there again at some point this spring. I, I would almost you know bank on that happening. But – the one to watch for me is Clemson. He was already down there. He has the offer. He liked the feel. And I know he says he's going back because he's going to be at Tennessee and then South Carolina. It just kind of fits his schedule. And I get it. I, I get it. it. It makes complete sense. But if you didn't like Clemson a whole bunch, you wouldn't be going back. So, the, so I think that's one to watch. 
He likes Brent Pry, the former Penn State DC, who's now the head coach of Virginia Tech. But I think Virginia Tech will be in it for a while with him too, maybe to the end. But for me, linebacker development, um, location is key with Penn State. It's not too far. Um, you know, for some families, it's easy to travel. For some families, it's not as easy to travel. And I know um, just in speaking with Tony and, and with his coach, it, it takes a little more planning when they're going to make trips. And so I, I look at all that stuff and it all factors in. I, I like where Penn State sits. There's a reason I haven't put in a crystal ball pick yet for him. I think Clemson, you really watch. But I think once he gets through this little stretch of visits, I think it'll really – I think his recruitment will crystallize a little bit more. And the one thing is everybody talks about Clemson or this or that. And when I was with him on Sunday, he's talking about all these other schools and, and people are like, oh, Clemson, you know, whatever. I said, you know, what do we – what are we um, looking at for schools? And he, and he gave a list. And I said, well – Penn State. And and it was just almost like, well, of course, Penn State's up there high. Why wouldn't they be? And I think it's really easy for people to overlook Penn State in this one because they've been there for a while. And because so many other new schools are coming up that he will then, you know, he want, people are asking about those and it's easy to forget about Penn State. Brian, a lot of the names I've mentioned are familiar to our listeners by now. We talked about them with you probably on this show at some point or another. Um, you've had a chance to get out and about here the last few weeks. I know you continue to do that uh, as spring continues to take over the Northeast. But any guys that you've seen on the camp circuit or, or have heard Penn State being uh, alluded to um, that maybe we're not discussing enough or, or some risers in that 24 class and, and so have you? No, I, I think you guys hit it pretty good because of the way you guys cover recruiting. And so it keeps them really up to date. And, and the way I look at it now with recruiting and where, I mean, what offers really mean a lot of times, I think for me, it's you can really start paying attention to kids when they when they set visits to campus or they get to campus, um, stuff like that. I think that stuff's really important. Um, I, I think one thing for people to look at though is our, our 24 rankings are coming out and really got a chance to watch Cooper Cousins and really delve into him a little bit more. And he's a good player with a, uh, with a nice room for development, but he's still pretty far along in the process and physical kid that, uh, you know, moves well in space. And I, I think again, he could be a guy that could play offensive tackle for the Nittany Lions. I, I think, you know, from my standpoint, I, I look at stuff like that. And I also look at, how much can Penn State get Quentin Martin on campus? You know, the, the 24 running back out of Western PA, which, again, you know, he's been there before. He likes Penn State, but this is going to be a kid at the end of the day is going to be a national recruit. And so Penn State getting in early on him is important, and we'll see what kind of dividends that pays in the long run. Cousins kicked off Penn State's 24 class back in January uh, out of Erie, Pennsylvania, offensive lineman. Uh, Brian, Last thing to get to for you, enough with the recruiting. One guy that we have talked with you, he's about to cross that threshold and become a Penn State freshman. Deny Dennis Sutton. James Franklin mentioned after practice last week, he's not on campus yet, but he's being talked about. They are in constant communication with him, trying to keep him basically downloading mental information as much as he possibly can right now from afar. So when he gets to campus, they feel like he's going to physically be ready to hit it. What do you think about the, the package of a prospect that they are bringing in uh, with Denied Dennis Sutton here in just a matter of months now? Yeah, I thought you were going to set me up for like some U.S. men's national team talk with the World Cup, <laughs> but alas, no. Um, listen, Deny Dennis Sutton has been high on our radar for a long time. Um, he is an extraordinary athlete with length, but more so than that, he is just a great kid. And listen, I don't care. When he graduates Penn State, I'm still going to call him a kid, all right? When you start knowing these these guys when they're 15 years old or whatever, they're always kids to you. Um, but he, he's an athletic marvel. He's got length. He's a sponge when it comes to just absorbing information and wanting to get better. Uh, he will work really hard. He is a high-character kid, and I think we saw that in the recruiting process with how he handled it. Um, for me – Listen, I hope he gets there and plays right away and dominates and gets out in three years and makes a ton of money. I think that would benefit him. I think it would benefit Penn State if you're talking about leaving early. But listen, I, I 
I don't really say much about freshmen and expectations coming in, but um, I'd be surprised if he didn't have some role in the defense, you know, from the first game. And by the time midseason rolls around, I think he's probably a name you'll hear a little bit more of as he gets comfortable because he's physically already there, right? He, it's not like, hey, we got to make him stronger. He's got to put on this weight. It's all there. He's he's 260 and he looks like he's 225. So he carries it really well. Um, and he finally got a chance to play some football. And just think of how much growth he has from a technique and learning standpoint, not only making the jump to college, but he didn't play as a junior because McDonough didn't play because of COVID. And then he missed the first few games of his senior year because he had a freak dislocation of his elbow in a scrimmage. So I think he missed two games of his senior year. Um, and then they're done playing by early November anyway. So think of, yes, he, you know, you'd like a little more experience on a high school level, but think of how much room for growth that kid has. I mean, I just, I just hope he does really well there to be honest. Yeah, he did some special things on the postseason circuit, ends up in that final five-star grouping on 24-7 Sports and make his practice debut here in August. Uh, again, we'll be back on the practice field on Wednesday evening, uh, our latest look at the Penn State Nittany Lions. We'll have a bunch of coverage at lions247.com. But we're going to wrap up this episode and stay on the recruiting note with our mailbag and end with Brian Doan. Uh, here's our mailbag question today, Brian. This is the first time in a few years that a recruiting class will get to work with a full spring official visit schedule how do you see that impacting the 2023 cycle? Uh, I think it'll be, a, I think it'll impact it in a big way, just from the sense that I think kids will be more patient. They'll want to get out and make visits because they know they can make them. They don't have to jam them all into June, but they also know that they can sit there and schedule them throughout June. Um, I, I think that, I think that's huge. Um, I think it'll slow some things down and I think it'll also, you know, the, the planning, does Penn State want a kid in the first weekend of June or the last weekend of June? First weekend, you make the first impression, maybe squeeze him a little. He doesn't make visits. Last weekend, there's the danger he commits before he gets to you. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's like last year, it was do it all in one month, figure it out. It was a frenzy. Yes. The year before, it was radio silence. There were no visits. Everything was on right. Zoom. It's nice to get back to normal. I know it's a lot of work for you and, and everyone involved, but I think we'll take it after the last couple of springs and, and what we were kind of sorting through. Brian, it's always great to have you back on. I'm sure it will not be long until your next appearance on the podcast, but really appreciate you stepping in. Guys, I, I always enjoy being on with you guys, so thank you. All right, on behalf of our producer, Lance Glenn, we'll have Sean Fitz back on the co-host seat next episode. I'm Tyler Donahue. Thanks for tuning in to the Lions 24-7 podcast.